<clears throat> All right, so we're in 6.2. We're um, talking about the concept of angle and orthogonality in inner product spaces. Um, this uh, section is going to start off with an inequality that we've looked at in the special case of Rn back in Chapter 3. Uh, it's the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. And back then we introduced it. Um, it was a necessary requirement to be able to talk about the angle between two vectors in Rn. Um, but at that time we said that we were going to defer the proof of this theorem until Chapter 6 because the proof in Chapter 6 can be done uh, to prove a more general case. And so that's where we are now. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to be working in an inner product space, a real inner product, sp inner product space. And if we have two vectors, u and v, in this inner product space, then the inner product of u with v is always less than or equal to the product of the norms of u and v. And we'll see after um, proving this why we need this inequality to be true in order for us to generalize the idea of angle between two vectors. So the proof of this theorem is... Uh, uh, it, it's it's not an intuitive one. Um, in a certain sense, we could argue that pretty much every theorem that we've proved up until this point has had a very direct proof. Um, if you if you kind of keep going in math and you and you um, you know take a course in proof methods and and you know do courses that are very very proof heavy like real analysis, abstract algebra, things like that. Um, you start to get a sense of what what a direct proof looks like, what kind of a straightforward proof looks like, and then what, what the uh, outside-of-the-box thinking types of proofs look like. This is kind of the first proof that we've, we're going to come across where you really need to take a leap um, outside of the box to, to, to come up with it. So it's not obvious from the outset why we do the steps that we do but you're going to see that it ends up proving the results. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with these two vectors, u and v, in this inner product space, and we're going to assume that u is non-zero. Um, the reason for that assumption is because if u was equal to zero, then both sides of this inequality up here would be zero, which would make this true. Zero is less than or equal to zero. So there's nothing really to prove in that case. Uh, that means we're safe assuming that u is non-zero. We don't really care about whether or not v is zero for this. Okay, then I'm going to um, define a couple of values, a or three values, a, b, and c, and this is where it's going to start to look a little bit like, why are we doing this? Um, I'm going to let a equal the inner product of u with itself, and remember, the inner product of u with itself is the same thing as the norm of u squared. We'll end up using that at the end of the proof. Um, B is going to be equal to 2 times the inner product of U with V, and C is going to equal the inner product of V with V. Okay, And then what we're going to do is pick some number, we're going to let T be any real number. So T is going to be treated like a variable, basically, but it's a scalar, specifically. Um, so we're going to use the positivity axiom to make a statement about a, an inner product that's going to th seem like it came out of nowhere. Um, we're going to take the inner product of t u plus v with itself. Now remember, anytime you take an inner product of a vector with itself, you always uh, get a non-negative result. That's the positivity axiom, and that's part of the definition of an inner product. So this is straight off, straight from the definition of an inner product. Um, and then what I'm going to do is start breaking this this inner product down using our additivity and homogeneity properties or axioms for an inner product. So first of all, notice um, this first component here is a sum of two things. My additive uh, axiom says I can break this into two inner products, both with a second component of two, t u plus v, so I'm seeing that here and here, but the first component in the first inner product will be t u and then v over here. So I split the uh, addition up into these two pieces. And then we proved a theorem that said that you could do the same thing in the second component. So each of these two inner products are going to split into two more inner products by breaking up the two terms in that second component, t u here and v here, t u here and v here. Okay. Next up, I'm going to use the homogeneity 
uh, axiom to start pulling these t's out. Remember, the t's are scalars. So remember, you, you really just pull scalars out of one component at a time. So looking at these two components here, homogeneity says I can take the t out of the inner product and write that as tuv. Um, we proved a theorem that said you could do the same thing in the second component, so this t would come out here. This um, first inner product here has a t being multiplied to each component. So if I pull it out of the first one, I'll have a t. If I pull out pull it out of the second one, I'll have t times t out there giving me this t squared. Okay. Finally, if you look at uh, these two terms in the middle, uv and vu, by the symmetry of uh, the inner product, these are actually the same. uv is equal to vu. So I can call them both uv and then add them together and that'll give me 2t uv. I'm gonna put the t over on the right here though. Remember, each of these will now be a scalar so it doesn't matter if we rearrange the order. Having done that, you're now kind of seeing where this a, b, and c are showing up. Um, u, the inner product of u with u, that's a. Here I have b, and see that's why we included the 2 in our definition for b up here. And then this would be c. So this could be written in the form a t squared plus b t plus c. Okay, why did we do that? Well, tracing that all the way back up here, this is a quadratic, and it's greater than or equal to 0. And notice in particular, a, which is defined to be the inner product of u with itself would have to be non-negative. In fact, it would have to be positive because of two reasons. One, the inner product of any vector with itself, like we said, according to the positivity axiom, is always greater than or equal to zero, but it's only ever equal to zero if u is a non-zero, or sorry, it's only ever equal to zero if u is zero, which we assumed that it wasn't. So a, the leading coefficient on this quadratic is positive. If I were to say set this like equal to y, y equals a t squared plus b t plus c, and then graph that, that's that's the graph of a parabola. And there's two cases that we could be talking about here. First of all, because that leading coefficient a is positive, we know that the parabola opens upward. And because it's greater than or equal to zero, that implies that every, every point on this uh, parabola is either completely above the x-axis or, at the very least, its vertex is on the x-axis. But no part of this can dip below the x-axis because of this inequality. That, if you remember from algebra, implies some things about the zeros of, uh, of this quadratic, the roots, if you will. So, uh, the uh, polynomial will either have no real roots because that would correspond to x-intercepts on this parabola, or it will have at most one repeated real root. In algebra, in intermediate algebra, we talk about a connection between the number of roots in a, poly in a quadratic polynomial and the discriminant of the quadratic, the discriminant being b squared minus 4ac. Um, if there are no real roots, that implies the discriminant is negative. If there's one repeated real root, that implies that the discriminant is equal to zero. So in either of these cases, we have b squared minus 4ac is less than or equal to zero, your discriminant. This is where we're going to get the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality from, this inequality right here. So using that fact, b squared minus 4ac is less than or equal to zero, I'm going to substitute the values for a, b, and c that we defined um, up here. Notice b is equal to 2 uv. So if I'm looking at b squared, squaring that will be 4 uv squared minus 4, and this was a, this was c. Dividing both sides by 4 and then adding uh, this term over to the right, and then also remembering that the inner product of u with itself is equal to the norm of u squared. The inner product of v with itself is equal to the norm of v squared. That gives me this. If I take square roots of both sides, that takes me to the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Okay, so that, that proves a very uh, non-intuitive proof in the sense of, you know, why would, we, why would we start this thing off the way that we did? But the whole point was to get to that discriminant and then the inequality came from that. So the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality has um, a lot of importance in other areas of math as well um, that come after linear algebra, but where we need it now is, like we said at the beginning, to define angle between two vectors.
in an inner product space. So looking at the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, both sides of this thing are not, um, or sorry, the, uh, this, uh, this side has to be non-negative. Um, and if it's not equal to zero, I can divide both sides of this by the norm of u times the norm of v. And because that's positive, this inequality is not gonna flip around. What that leads to is this compound inequality. This uh, states that the inner product of u with v divided by the product of the norms of u and v will always be somewhere between negative one and positive one, possibly equal to either of those. The reason that matters is because that means that the inverse cosine of this quantity is always defined. That's why we needed that Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Why would we take the inverse cosine of this? Well, if you remember in chapter three, when we talked about the dot product, we showed that the uh, angle between two vectors in R2 or R3 is always equal to the inverse cosine of the dot product of u with v divided by the uh, magnitudes, the product of the magnitudes of u with v. So what this is doing is it's swapping that dot product out for the more general inner product and then just extending this as a definition for the angle between two vectors. So this is how we define the angle between two vectors. Theta is equal to the inverse cosine of the inner product of u with v divided by the product of the norms of u with v. Okay, so I'm going to do this one on the next video, but um, just to set this up, what we're going to do uh, in this example is try to think of an angle, or not think of an angle, but determine the angle between two polynomials in P2, these two here, 2x squared plus 1 and 4x minus 3 in the standard inner product on P2. And again, this is a matter of definition. We, had, we defined the angle between two vectors as that inverse cosine of that quantity. It's very difficult to visualize that. Um, but right now, we're, we're just going to determine what that angle is, and then we're going to see why we would care about something as bizarre as an angle between two matrices or two polynomials or two vectors in any inner product space. Um, but that's going to come up in the next video.